Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, allowing me to be here with my second lecture. This talk is about ultrasound, or to be more accurate, about use of intraoperative ultrasound in neurosurgery. And some of you may already have it, some may still consider getting it. And this will be hopefully an unbiased view of a neurosurgeon from a colleague to a colleague. And during the next few minutes, I would like to discuss briefly about why I think it is important to have this option in your operating theater. A few words about history, about the equipment, how to choose it, um, the technique in particular, how to obtain a good image. And uh, we'll briefly discuss about applications, looking at some specific cases uh, from my personal practice. Today, uh, when we open the dura, we commonly see this kind of image. Yeah, So it's a normal looking brain and we know that somewhere under the surface of this brain, uh, there is a lesion. So what we don't want to do, we don't want to mess around. We want to see exactly where the lesion is located. Uh, the second question we'll have is where are the important anatomical and functional uh, structures? And the third question we'll have is what is the safest way uh, to get to this lesion without causing any harm to our patients. And uh, today we have quite a large variety of armamentarium to help us to resolve these kind of questions. We have intraoperative MRI scan, the navigation, uh, cortical mapping, 5LA, ICG, you name it. But I would like to speak about ultrasound. And over the last couple of decades, I visited many neurosurgical departments in different places around the world. Uh, some of the departments had the high-tech uh, equipment uh, with everything you can imagine. Uh, some other departments will have just basic, but still they continue to do a good job with the equipment they have. And uh, on one hand, we should have the most important, uh, the anatomical knowledge. These are the photos which I've taken from one of my books just over there. Uh, and this book is probably more than 120 years old. In particular, the senior uh, generation of the neurosurgeons potentially can recognize all these lines of Cronline, Championnier, a line of Poirier. And if you know these lines, uh, which have been described so many years ago, you already will do a really good job. On another hand, we have technology. And uh, of course, uh, everybody would like to have the most expensive equipment in theater, the intraoperative MRI scan, the best team on the planet. Uh, and we all want to drive the fastest car. However, sometimes this is uh, really not possible for various reasons. And intraoperative MRI sounds very good. And this is what we have in Sheffield, in Children's Hospital. Uh, it is basically an, a normal operating theater, but when uh, uh, there is a need to get an MRI scan, we open the door and uh, the child goes to the next room uh, on the operating table, gets the scan and returns uh, back to the operating theater. You can even change the color, uh, which is part of the package which came with this MRI scan. There are some buts uh, associated with this MRI scan. Uh, first of all, it comes with some costs, uh, which are not really small. You have to consider that this is not just the cost of the MRI scan, this is also the cost of the op dedicated operating table. Uh, it is the cost of MRI compatible clamp. Uh, it is the cost of the building uh, refurbishing and changing it to accommodate an MRI scan with all the shielding and so on. In addition to this, remember, uh, every time when you want to do an MRI scan, it will be at least half an hour for the patient to go to the scanner, come back and imagine then uh, what will happen if you have to do this several times during one surgery. On the other hand, we have the other option of low field MRI scan, which is there in operating theater. Uh, when needed, uh, we get the scan, we just cover with this um, curtain around the patients. And this is the photos I've taken in Brussels um, probably 15 years ago. It was quite helpful. It will give you sufficient information, but the image quality would not be the same as uh, e image quality, which usually will have on a high field MRI scan. And the very good alternative to the intraoperative MRI scan is this intraoperative ultrasound, which remains 
still one of my favorite options for interoperative orientation and localization. So in the last 20 years, uh, I was able to see both interoperative MRI scan and ultrasound. And I can say with confidence and probably in 90% of cases, uh, when the interoperative MRI scan was used, you could easily achieve the same with the interoperative ultrasound. It can show you what you want to do. It can show you the location and sometimes it can provide even more uh, details than the MRI scan. As you can imagine, the ultrasound was not invented by humans and the nature is using it with great success for many years. And we uh, humans discovered it only in 1794 uh, when Lazarus Spallanzani from Italy showed how bats can accurately navigate in the dark without bumping into things uh, using this echo reflection from a inaudible sound in high frequency. So he reasoned that they must be using one of their five senses and uh, uh, in his uh, experiments, which I must say were quite cruel. I mean, if somebody will dare to do the same experiments now in 21st century, probably will go to jail. Uh, he was basically cutting the ears, cutting the nose, removing the eyes, trying to identify which organ is responsible for this accurate um, flying in the darkness. Although it was discovered for 200 years, we started using it on a large scale only after the sinking of Titanic and uh, Paul Langevin invented this hydrophone to detect icebergs. Uh, basically, this was the first transducer uh, which was able to send and then to receive these uh, low frequency sound waves. And uh, this hydrophone was later used to detect submarines in the World War I and subsequently World War II, uh, obviously evolving uh, every uh, couple of years. In medicine, it came thanks to Karl Theodosik, the neurologist in Vienna, which was born from immigrants from Czech Republic, from Prague. Um, and he was working in the hospital at Bad Ischl in Austria and uh, the University of Vienna started uh, kind of experimenting with cranial ultrasound as a diagnostic tool. And uh, he tried to detect brain tumors, called this technique as hyperphonography. Uh, he used a method in which this transducer was placed on both sides of the patient and submerged uh, in the water. Uh, as you can see on this image, the patient's head was also partially underwater as well. Mm, they transmitted sound waves towards the patient at a known rate and these echoes, they were recorded on this uh, heat sensitive paper. Uh, so these were among the first ultrasound images uh, to diagnose the brain tumors. One of the first question uh, is how to choose the best ultrasound machine. And in the last 15, 20 years, I used a wide range of uh, ultrasound machines and trust me, all of them have been very helpful. So whatever you have, it will certainly be beneficial. Now, there are several companies available and I, I presume a lot depends on how much money your managers will be willing to spend. Uh, it is important to remember that uh, many of you may already have the ultrasound machine in the hospital, probably in another department. So if you have a friend, uh, maybe in gynecology or urology department or general surgery, the machine is usually there. And what you need to do is just to get the probe, which you can use in neurosurgery, borrowing their machine if uh, you cannot get a, a new one. And uh, every company has numerous probes. So uh, what is important is to find the probe which is good for your purposes. And uh, those of you who know me a bit closer will know that I'm a keen photographer and uh, almost always I have a camera with me. So I wish, uh, really, I wish I could have all the lenses, but it would be unrealistic uh, and practical and probably too expensive. So what I do, I just select few lenses which uh, fit most of my needs. And uh, once in a while, I'll just upgrade with another lens, uh, obviously without telling my wife about the cost of such lenses. One of the things which is important to remember is relationship of the transducer frequency and the image quality or, uh, and depth. So what is important to remember is that a probe of a high frequency will give you a very good image quality, but it will not be uh, able to see all the way down in the brain. So it will be visible mainly on the surface of the brain and vice versa. If you have a, a probe of a low frequency, it, you'll be able to explore the whole head cavity, but the image quality will not be as good as the high frequency probe. So my advice is try to explore, try to find the probe which is best for you or for this specific case. And uh, ideally you want to have a couple of probes which you can change depending on the needs. Second thing is a shape of transducer. You can have a linear probe uh, or you can have this convex or phased array. Again, my advice, try uh, to explore, try to find 
the, the, the best alternative for a specific case. These are the probes which uh, we use in Sheffield. Uh, they will probably cover 99% of our needs. Uh, when you have a probe, uh, think that it should be uh, small enough, as, as I mentioned. From these probes, the, my favorite one is this hockey stick. So you can bend the foot plate according to the needs. The image quality is absolutely fantastic. It is a linear probe uh, uh, and uh, again, the resolution is, is brilliant and I'll show you in a few next slides. Um, another probe uh, is the borehole, which is helpful for your routine activity. The image quality is not as good as you would like it to be, but it still gives you enough information. And the benefit is that it is small enough to, to fit in the burr hole, which can be uh, used for uh, placing a ventricular shunt or EVD or for doing some biopsy guided by the ultrasound. Uh, as with any equipment, it is not enough to have it. Uh, we need to learn to use it in order to get best of it. And it is important to learn some tips and tricks and to practice uh, in order to obtain the good image quality. The good thing is that neurosurgeons, we neurosurgeons are normally considered to be very intelligent people who can learn uh, everything quite quickly. And I can assure you that in a week or two, you'll be comfortable with uh, interpreting the ultrasound images. First rule, spend some time to learn your buttons before the surgery and not when you're in the middle of the case. There is nothing worse than to, to be scrubbed in theater and trying to explain uh, to a nurse who never saw the machine to, to do something and press some uh, random buttons and uh, then subsequently to blame the machine that it doesn't work. Usually this is not a machine which doesn't work. Usually this is us users who may not know all the buttons and settings. So again, important to play with this, uh, get comfortable with all the buttons. Uh, and then once you know this in the, in, in, in real case, it will be really easy. There are two simple things to remember. Uh, one is that the ultrasound probe should be in full contact with the brain and normal saline over the, uh, the brain or gel. Second is that the ultrasound doesn't like air bubbles uh, or bone interposed between the probe and your brain. So it should be either gel or water or direct contact on the brain or dura. Now uh, try to explore with the probe without applying pressure on the neural structures. And one of the commonest beginner's mistake is to stick the probe and expect straight away the lesion. Um, I think it's easy to extrapolate to the MRI scan, uh, same as scrolling through a set of MRI images until you find the lesion. You should do the same with the ultrasound. You should scroll on the surface with the probe. You can slide it, you can rotate it, you can tilt the probe until you get the best image. Uh, try to recognize normal anatomy first and I deliberately didn't put the best anatomical image. This is an image from 15 years ago and if you, you can recognize the hyperechogenic structures, the folks, the choroid plexus, um, uh, surface of the bone, um, ventricles usually will be hyperechogenic. So that's something which you'll need to remember. And again, um, use it routinely and you'll got, get comfortable with all the anatomy quite quickly. Uh, today's image is so much better. This is the spinal cord, sagittal and axial images. And you can recognize uh, dural sac, CSF inside, the PM matter, central sulcus, uh, PLL. You can really see this good anatomy uh, on the modern ultrasound. On another hand, you want to know how abnormal lesions look like. So approximately 10 years ago, I, I published a paper in British Journal of Neurosurgery where I uh, try to describe this. And as you can see, most of the lesions will be hyperechogenic. So it will be cavernomas, meningioma, metastatic lesions, fresh hematomas. Uh, you may have some moderately hyperechogenic lesions, which usually will be represented by edema or some glial tumors and some metastases. And the hypoechogenic structures is usually a fluid. Uh, so it could be either a cyst or an abscess, or, or, or again, you can recognize the ventricles, cisterns, and so on. The image quality is significantly altered by the artifacts generated by reflections. So I already mentioned about the importance of avoiding bone and air. It is equally important to try to clean the surgical field from the blood clots. Uh, any surgical parties, surgical cell, hemostatic material can create significant artifacts. So before trying to get the image, it's a good idea to remove all the foreign material, get the scan, and then you will have a better orientation with, with your image. 
Having said that, let's look where ultrasound can be really beneficial. And this is probably a fraction of applications where ultrasound can be uh, helpful. Uh, first of all, it's for your orientation. Second is to uh, find, uh, to identify some lesions, either small or large, to have assessment of the degree of tumor resection. You can assess the vascular supply uh, of uh, different structures. You can identify some specific vessels. You can place shunts, do the biopsy, and so on. Let's look at brain tumors. A few years ago, I wanted to answer the question, how visible are various intracranial lesions? And I basically looked at everything I operated on. So with this in mind, I thought that it would be good to grade different tumors according to their ultrasonographic visibility. And I proposed a classification which was published in Acta Neurochirurgica um, a few years ago now. And good thing is that I was able to identify all abnormalities which I was looking for uh, with the ultrasound and another good thing is that most of them have been very well visible with the ultrasound. Now let's start with some examples and at that time the machine uh, we used was far from what is currently available nevertheless we could clearly see uh, uh, what we wanted to see so on the left side we have a CT scan in the middle we have the ultrasonographic image you can identify the midline you can identify the skull you can identify the cystic part of the tumor and the uh, tumor itself uh, and the ultrasound you can see is applied directly on the tumor so it helps you with this orientation and and the modern ultrasound machine gives you so much better picture. So this is uh, the scale on the right side, so you can see exactly the size of the abnormality. And uh, you can identify a tumor which is located just at the bottom of the sulcus. So you can follow the sulcus and have a really minimally invasive approach and you will hit directly the edge of this metastatic lesion, remove it without causing any unnecessary uh, brain tissue manipulation and any new damage. Uh, once you learn to identify and define a lesion, you can explore additional benefits the ultrasound may offer, specifically for tumors. Uh, good news is that uh, you not just see the tumor, you can also have estimation of degree of resection. Yeah, so you can assess uh, whether you achieved uh, gross total removal, if there is any residual and so on. And it's really, really helpful in some specific cases. This is the patient uh, with uh, anaplastic gastrocytoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade three so it has to be removed as much as possible and uh, on the left side you have the ultrasound before uh, the resection is started and then in the middle you can see the ultrasound image uh, with some partial debulking of the tumor and the cavity uh, created and on the right side at the end of the surgery tumor is completely removed and you just see some artifact from hemostatics at the bottom uh, of the cavity created. The post-operative MRI scan shows good picture with gross total removal of the tumor. That's what we wanted to achieve. In addition to the fact that you can see the tumor, you can see where major vessels are located. So on the left side, you can see the big vessel which is displaced by the tumor. You can recognize this on the MRIs. At the same time, you can see whether the sinus uh, is invaded by meningioma as on the bottom right image. Ultrasound is extremely helpful for doing biopsy and this is very helpful in particular in uh, in departments which still may not have the navigation or uh, the option of having this stereotactic biopsy. So with the ultrasound, option one is you can do a bigger craniotomy and on one side of craniotomy you put the ultrasound probe, on the other side under the ultrasound guidance you can insert your forceps or needle into the target, get the specimen and close and you can see it in real time. The alternative is a less invasive one. So you have a small burr hole, which is kind of less than a centimeter. In this burr hole, you have a burr hole probe with, with which you can identify the optimal trajectory and you can see exactly the distance from the surface of the brain until you hit the target. Next step is you remove the ultrasound probe, but using the same trajectory, going on the same distance as suggested by the ultrasound, you will insert your instrument and you can uh, comfortably get specimen. And this is a patient with the left frontal abscess. Its drainage was possible with minimal impact on the normal neural tissue. Uh, you can see the tip of the ultrasound needle inside the abscess and you can, if you aspirate it, you can see how this is shrinking uh, in real time as subsequently was confirmed. One can argue that you can do the same with navigation, of course, if you have this navigation, but the 
issue with navigation is you're operating on the images which have been obtained days or uh, probably weeks in advance and you don't see any real-time changes. Once you've done craniotomy, open the dura and drain some CSF, the brain is collapsing and all anatomical structures will be displaced. You can see at the, in, in the bottom row the walls of the cystic cavity don't really overlap with the image on the MRI scan. So the real one is the ultrasonographic one and if you don't have this option then uh, you can see that the displacement could be of more than a centimeter, which could be misleading and harmful for the patient. I particularly find ultrasound helpful in the surgery of uh, spinal intradural tumors, and I use it routinely for most of my cases. And this uh, modern ultrasound machine gives you an outstanding possibility to look inside the dural sac without opening dura. This is a very trivial example. The intraspinal tumor uh, located anterior to the spinal cord before opening the dura you already can have more details than uh, you could probably see on the MRI scan. So you can see the cystic component of the tumor, which is dark. You can see the membranes, the location. You can plan your dural incision as needed and see the exact location of the tumor without the need to mobilize the spinal cord excessively. Uh, so you can aspirate the cystic component and see how much it is deflated, after which you can nicely deliver this tumor on the side of the spinal cord, avoiding unnecessary manipulation, as you can see in the bottom uh, image. Another good example is tumor located anterolaterally to, to the spinal cord. And if you divide this dentate ligament, you can rotate slightly the spinal cord, kind of expanding the window for this tumor. And this is obviously done under the guidance uh, of intraoperative monitoring. And the purpose of this slide is just to give you the options to compare between the convex and phased array and linear probe and see if there is, if you can see any difference. So there's really good image quality. In intramedullary tumors, it is extremely important to know with 100% certainty where the tumor is located. And you don't want to guess. Uh, the spinal cord may look completely normal on the surface. Sometimes it is expanded, but not always. The ultrasound can help you a lot with this. So in addition to this, in particular in ependymomas with cupping cysts, you, you want to be able to locate uh, very accurately the top and the bottom end of the tumor, as well as the cysts, uh, which, you, which are quite helpful to with, with, uh, with tumor dissection. Once again, here ultrasound is extremely helpful. So what you do, you debulk the tumor with the CUSA and then you can dissect it uh, with the uh, bipolar away from the spinal cord, avoiding any unnecessary manipulation of the spinal cord. And in the end, uh, after some debulking and maybe some a bit of piecemeal removal, you will be able to achieve uh, gross total removal, hopefully without causing any new harm to the patient. And it is even more important to locate accurately a very small lesion. It can be very difficult and extremely frustrating to search for a black cat in a dark room, in particular when this cat is not there. And this is the patient with very small uh, cavernoma, cavernous malformation inside the spinal cord. It is highly important to be able to uh, locate these lesions accurately. After opening the dura, the spinal cord looks absolutely normal. Uh, some people suggested ICG, but I think this is of little benefit. The main options to locate this is the ultrasound, which gives you this ability to confirm with 100% accuracy that you are operating in the right place. And once you have this reassurance, uh, you can open the spinal cord uh, with a diamond knife and expose this uh, tumor. I'll go quickly through this and achieve a nice removal of the cavernoma without causing any new harm, without unnecessary manipulating through the spinal cord. In vascular lesions, the ultrasound brings additional important benefits and it can assess the vascular supply and can provide you with information about how vascular is the tumor. This is a patient with hemangioblastoma. You can see how significantly uh, how significant is the compression on the spinal cord with this hemangioblastoma. It is a highly vascular lesion which you can appreciate on preoperative angiography. Now, once we open the dura, uh, we, we could see that this hemangioblastoma was very stuck, very adherent to the dura on the left side. This is where it was. there was a bit of bleeding and we uh, coagulated this, ble uh, this uh, attachment, dissected it and uh, we were able to control the bleeding with um, bipolar and uh, usual uh, hemostatic material. In this case, it was some fibrillar surgery cell. And after disconnecting this attachment to the dura, I checked with the ultrasound 
and I was surprised to see that there was no flow anymore in this uh, hemangioblastoma. So that was very reassuring. Uh, but I wanted to check it again uh, with the ICG and on the ICG on the left side you can see that despite having a nice flushing around this lesion the hemangioblastoma remains dark so that was extremely helpful to confirm that this lesion is not going to bleed uh, with my f uh, subsequent surgery which is completely different to the case on the right side uh, where you can see that uh, the lesion is highly vascular so there is um, high blood supply, so I really want to identify these feeding vessels to hemangioblastoma before uh, messing around. This is just uh, image after excision of these hemangioblastomas in both cases. Another interesting case is this one, a 76-year-old lady with a history of osteoporosis and fracture in 2012. You can see some cement augmentation that time, but there was no tumor, and she developed some new symptoms recently and had another MRI scan which showed that uh, she had a new tumor uh, which was extending both intraspinally and extraspinally so this classical dumbbell tumor and this was quite a challenging case for several reasons the first reason is that uh, she is not young uh, but the, the scan showed clearly that there is a tumor which was growing so it had to be operated uh, second one is that the extension of the tumor it was a dumbbell tumor extending both extraspinally and intraspinally so to remove this one we have to sacrifice the facet joint which means that we'll have to stabilize this patient but this patient is already known with osteoporosis and in addition to this, you can see that she also had very tiny pedicle. And on top of this, to make things even more complicated, this was a dumbbell tumor, which means that part of this tumor uh, was likely to be located intradurally. And um, so we decided to proceed with surgery. And we have a privilege of having this intraoperative 3D x-ray in Sheffield. So this is a 3D x-ray, not a CT with the patient on the table, which helps us to uh, uh, identify the optimal entry point. And with navigation, we are able to cannulate the pedicles on both sides and first things to stabilize the patient. Then we remove the tumor. And the last dilemma was whether there is any intradural extension. So normally we, the option would be to open the dura and see if there is anything inside but in this case we just used ultrasound with the ultrasound we could nicely confirm that there is no intradural extension uh, and uh, we, we were able to close uh, uh, the case and next day MRIs can just confirm that we've that we've we achieved a gross total re excision without having to open unnecessarily the dura and to explore inside it there are several other indications when the ultrasound can be helpful. I'm afraid I don't have time to go through everything. This is just one of the papers which was pu which we published uh, in Journal of Ultrasonography. If somebody is really interested, uh, please explore. There are lots of other of benefits of this ultrasound. Uh, one uh, good indication which can be used in uh, just routine neurosurgical practice is spinal decompression assessment of spinal decompression. This is a patient, as you can see on the MRI scan, with severe spinal cord compression. And initially we were planning to do the uh, ACDF, to do the disc de de removal. But then after doing the CT scan and seeing this calcification, which are extending behind the vertebral body, we felt it probably will be uh, less uh, risky to do it uh, from the back. Uh, but the, obviously the concern was whether we achieved satisfactory decompression or not. So after laminectomy, we could see nicely that the spinal cord is very well decompressed. This is the disc uh, which was previously pushing the spinal cord, but now the spinal cord is nicely pulsating inside the dural sac without being compressed. And it was very satisfying to see this intraoperatively. Last but not least, I would like to say just a few words about the benefits of uh, ultrasound in decompression of patients with Chiari malformation. We all have this dilemma whether we should open the dura or not, and in some cases this is really necessary, in some cases this is not necessary, and how to differentiate this, uh, ultrasound can be really, really helpful. So by placing the ultrasound probe after removing the bone, you can see whether there is any nicely restored CSF flow, as in this case with some bubbles uh, around the spinal cord and tonsils. In this case, it looks very nicely decompressed, so we were able to achieve decompression without having to open the dura. Lots of other benefits, in particular in kids. You remember that you can do this ultrasonographic exploration through the fontanelles before they are closed. You can assess the size of the ventricle. You can uh, do use it as a screening technique to look at the ventricle size or to see if there is any gross abnormality without having to expose the child 
through the radiation of a CT scan or uh, challenges of the MRI scan. For those of you who are keen endoscopists, you can use this ultrasonographic probe, which, can, which is small enough to go through the endoscope and you can see beyond the, what you can see on the ultrasound. You can see some vessels, you can see the carotid artery when needed and so on. To summarize, ultrasound has several advantages. First of all, it is a real-time information. It provides immediate feedback. Uh, it gives you a really good image quality. Uh, it can compensate for brain shift and recognize this. Um, it's really easy to use. You can have it ready within two, three minutes and you can repeat it as much as necessary, as many times as necessary. It is not harmful for the patient. There is no radiation and uh, it can give you lots of additional information like vascular uh, details about the vessels, blood flow. Um, you can nicely combine it with navigation, getting best of both of these uh, equipments. Of course, there are some small disadvantages. First of all, it is a learning curve. And uh, as I said, we neurosurgeons are intelligent people. So I am, I'm absolutely confident that any of us can learn this very nicely within a couple of weeks. Uh, but even if you don't have time to learn it yourself, I'm sure you can identify a younger member of your team who is good with technology. He will be a very valuable member of your team, especially when you're in a difficult situation. The take home messages, there are few. First of all, ultrasound is a machine which is really easy to use. So I think I'm, I'm, I strongly believe that all of us should have uh, it available in uh, each department. Uh, the cost is accessible. Uh, it is a useful adjunct and which can be used in a wide range of neurosurgical procedures, both cranial and spinal. The main message is to get familiar with this kind of technology, we need to keep practicing. So if you do it routinely, it is just another uh, equipment which helps you to be better than uh, just knowing the anatomy from the book from 120 years ago. I hope it will encourage at least some of you to use this ultrasound uh, routinely if you still don't have it. And uh, I really hope that next year uh, we will have time to meet face to face live in this beautiful place in Bukovel. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if you have time for one or two questions.